Let's proceed. May it please the court. Good morning, justices of the Supreme Judicial Court. My name is Stephen Carley, Assistant District Attorney from Worcester, representing the Commonwealth. With me is Assistant District Attorney Michelle King, who wrote the brief. Though the case before the court presents uh, an opportunity to improve and more closely define Massachusetts search and seizure law, I'd, a I'd emphasize for the court this morning that the relief that we're seeking is actually fairly narrow, the reversal of the suppression of physical evidence uh, from the vehicle that was stopped. Um, three theories justify the reversal of the suppression of that evidence. This was a plain view search. This was a valid search incident to arrest and two of the uh, three defendants abandoned any expectation of privacy in the physical evidence. Only then, I believe, uh, is the court required to address the concerns about whether automatic uh, entry or re-entry orders for passengers um, is justified under Article, uh, under article so, 14. So is what you're saying is that we, wouldn't, we don't need to reach it because, in your view, it is a plain view search, people abandoned, et cetera? Is that, is that I right? I think that's... In terms of the physical evidence that was suppressed, uh, those, uh, the physical evidence should be not subject to suppression because of three different bases for uh, concluding that the search was lawful. Without uh, reaching. Without your... reaching because the, the two passengers who exited the vehicle, I believe that if, that if there was an unlawful seizure of those two individuals, only observations or further evidence resulting from that unlawful seizure would be subject to suppression. But the physical evidence was remained with the car and was found with the car, and therefore any theory that justifies the search of the vehicle and the seizure of that evidence would justify the entry of that evidence against one or more of these defendants. Could, well, are, you, are you suggesting that the f two individuals who left the car, that the fact that they fled the car is not even relevant to our evaluation of the appropriateness of the search of the motor vehicle? It's relevant to the extent that um, it, un it emphasizes that there was an abandonment by those two individuals of any expectation of privacy that they had in the contents of the vehicle and the vehicle itself. And so with respect to those two individuals, the abandonment argument, I think, is dispositive. Th those two individuals clearly manifested no intent to exercise any or to continue to exercise any control. They left and showed no intention to return. To return. And I One take it that they left before the police said anything about stay. That's correct, because uh, the testimony was that as soon as the individuals exited the vehicle while the vehicle had come, after the vehicle had come to a stop, only then did the officer exit from his vehicle and ask them to stop. It was their uh, motion, it was their attempt to flee that triggered his uh, seizure order. So the judge made a finding that they didn't look around, there was no reason to think that, uh, was there, uh, based on her findings, that they left doors open, or you're characterizing it as fled, but you could read the judge's findings as they got out of the car and they went toward the house. So uh, she, yes. didn't, she did not find that they had abandoned anything. She, she express, uh, Judge Page specifically said that they did not abandon, but there was very little analysis to that conclusion. Well, However, but if, if you base it on the fact that they just walked, <clears throat> they just walked away, um, and it was uh, they didn't look around, they they weren't necessarily aware of the police. That that's not compatible with an abandonment theory. If those were the only facts, I'd suggest that that's correct. However, um, Judge Page did specifically find that she did not credit the officer's testimony that the two individuals in the car looked back at the officer during the stop. So I don't believe that we can rely on that piece of evidence. That's not before us on this record, and it's not clearly erroneous. What I would suggest, however, is those two individuals did flee the scene uh, while the officer attempted to uh, ask them to remain and ordered them to remain. Uh, they picked up their pace. Both of them fled in different directions, one around the residential complex and one fled into the residential uh, complex into an apartment that where there was no evidence that he had any uh, ownership or a, uh, authorization to be in that apartment, barricaded himself inside the apartment, and then uh, barricaded himself inside the bathroom and got into the shower. In that situation, Your Honor, I'd suggest that the... And was there evidence as to who owned or who, who the renter, who the, who the people who had uh, proprietary rights in the apartments were or that these people did not have any right to be there? The, there was no conclusive evidence to support uh, the idea that anyone 
involved in this situation owned that apartment or had any proprietary rights. So we right. don't know uh, then whether or not they did or did not have the right to be there. I don't think we know for a fact, but I think the reasonable inference is that there was damage to that door that uh, Defendant <coughs> Hendricks entered. Uh, it was barricaded closed. They attempted to barricade the door closed with a piece of furniture behind the door, and then he locked himself in the bathroom in an attempt <coughs> to evade police. Was he alone in that apartment? He was alone in that apartment. However, Judge Page decided, and I think she was uh, correct to do so, that this justified exigent entry into the apartment because we don't know who could have been in that apartment, or at least the officers didn't know who could have been in there, and that his, uh, in, under those circumstances, breaking through that door and attempting to barricade himself inside, he could have posed a threat to someone inside, the property inside, something of that C nature. Counsel, uh, the judge said this. She said, here, other than the fact that there were three young black men in a car at 10.30 p.m., the defendants exhibited no furtive gestures or other suspicious behavior that would warrant their detention. Thus, the pursuit of Cherry and Hendricks was disproportionate, unreasonable, and unlawful. If the judge was the finder of fact and she concluded there were no furtive gestures or other suspicious behavior, isn't her conclusion correct? I believe she found that there is no, there were no furtive gestures, and I believe the I just read to you what she yes, found. Yes, and, 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 and I believe the Commonwealth is bound by the no furtive gestures finding, because it's the, up to the judge to decide what the or testimony was. Or other suspicious was. behavior. But I would suggest, because I believe the suspicion is whether, whether the defendant's behavior as found, fleeing from the scene, that was not disputed, um, and the remainder of their behavior is suspicious under the tests under the Fourth Amendment and Article 14, I'd suggest that is an independent determination for this court. And I believe this court can find that it was suspicious, as this court has found in the past, for the passengers to immediately exit the vehicle. And if not at least suspicious, then at least a safety concern. And I'd point the court to a previous decision, Commonwealth v. Torres, cited in our brief. And in that case, a passenger exited the vehicle upon approach of the trooper, in fact, exited the vehicle while the trooper was beside the car. This court said that while that wasn't necessarily inherently suspicious in and of itself, it's not necessarily suspicious just for a passenger to alight from the vehicle, it was a safety concern for the trooper. And in this instance, if, the, if it's true that reentry orders should be examined at the same as exit orders, as this court did in Gonsalves, then I'd suggest that the passengers leaving the vehicle and fleeing the scene is at least a safety concern for the, just for the that officer. Up for a minute. I, I can't I understand the principle that if somebody's getting out of the car for a, an infraction, motor vehicle infraction, and hanging around, you might wonder, you're the only police officer there. These individuals left. They're not there anymore. As far as the officer could see, on a dark night in a, in a only fairly well-lit area. One went into the building, one went around the building. That the officer learned later. But the situation the officer was presented there. with after, or at the time where he was left alone with the driver at the side of the vehicle, those two individuals had fled from his sight and he didn't know if they would Principle return. The is yes. that when there is a motor vehicle infraction, there is no evidence in addition to that of furtive gesture or anything else that gives rise to suspicion, passengers leave and walk away, and you suddenly have the basis to search I don't that you didn't have before. I don't think the What's the principle? I don't think the facts present that particular principle or would necessarily justify that particular Those principle. Those are the findings, wouldn't those are some of the findings. However, I'd suggest that there were additional findings or, or at least uh, evidence to support the theory that this was an unfamiliar area, well, not an unfamiliar area, but these were unfamiliar individuals to the officer. This was at night in an area where pre, uh, crimes had occurred. Um, so this was a high crime area, and I think it's justified under the circumstances where the officer is outnumbered three to one. And now that those individuals have left but, the but, area but could return, that legitimate safety concerns should allow the officer to May just, I interrupt you? Yes, just, of course, Your Honor. The, the reason for the stop was it was a traffic offense. That's correct. A minor traffic offense. That's correct, Your Honor. And, and so you're saying even when the offense is a minor traffic offense, if people leave, that's a basis for a concern for safety? <laughs> it is, Your Honor. 
I'd suggest it is, especially under these circumstances. What where it's at night and the officer is outnumbered. He has no additional support or backup in the area. So then a police officer can search when it, whenever there's an offense? No, Your Honor. In, no, that is, not, that is not the rule that we're asking for. The rule that we would be asking for with respect to the fleeing passengers was only that upon approach to the vehicle for a motor vehicle stop, that the officer would be allowed to maintain the status quo, just have the passengers remain inside the vehicle long enough to complete the reason for the stop. That would be issuing a citation for the failure to stop at the stop sign and checking the, uh, the, uh, the driver's license and registration. That couldn't happen here because those passengers left. If no further suspicion uh, <clears throat> arose from that situation, if no further safety concerns arose from that suspicion and the reason for the stop is complete, the driver and the passengers would have to be on their way. We are not asking for more authority than so that. So a mother and, and a child who has to go to the bathroom badly and they stop for that reason and the police uh, have uh, basically come up in the same circumstances, but the people who get out of the car are the mother and the child to go into the building to use the bathroom. You're saying on your theory that the police officer can stop them from leaving until the police officer is satisfied that that's, you know, everything is copacetic. Just long enough to complete the purposes of the stop. And that could be in the, the police stop. officer's total discretion. Yes, Your Honor. Well, I don't, and I and I understand that these are the. It would be up to the officer under that situation, under the principle that we're asking. And I don't think that just because that the officer would have the authority to do so would mean that he would prevent the mother and uh, or the can't child. Can't make a rule that goes on. No, we think people will behave. Nice, you know, no, nice I, I understand the court's position on that. I understand that. But I think because it would, because the rule that we're asking for is limited only to effectuate the purpose of the stop and no further, assuming no further safety concerns arise, assuming no further suspicion arises, but, the could, reasons for the motor vehicle stop, you, I mean, the driver may have to use the restroom. The driver could be a pregnant woman. Different who, story. But the driver is the one who's committed the infraction. That's correct, the driver. Your Honor. Yes. And unless, uh, you'd have maybe some better arguments if there weren't people wearing, if maybe they weren't wearing seatbelts and there was another civil infraction that involved the passenger. But this didn't involve any passengers. No, no civil problem. infractions by the passengers. Correct. That's correct, Your Honor. But, but no Arizona versus Johnson makes it quite clear that when a car is stopped for a traffic violation, everyone in the car is seized. Isn't that the point? That's correct. And when and the person attempts to leave, the officer is well within his jurisdiction to say, return to the car. Yes, I think so. And I believe that's the rule both under Article 14 and the Fourth Amendment. Well, how, how far that's what can you're it, asking for. How, how far how far can a police officer track somebody down and for what duration, for what period of time can, can this carry on in order for him to determine whether or not a citation should issue? Well, I could, think could, if, if he had run a mile away, can the police officer run a mile and bring the people back? I suppose that would be the case, but at that, I think the, the hypothetical presented there is stretching the ability for the officer to maintain control well, so, over so, any portion of the stop. So, so what, how do we, uh, what are the factors? How do we guide judges? How, what, what kind of guidance can we give judges in these or situations? Police. Well, I believe the, the guidance is that the officer would have the authority to do so, but whether he's able to effectuate that authority by himself on the street and whether the individuals choose to obey that reentry order is a situation that a judicial rule cannot control. But, they, but then I take it the follow-up as happened in this case. If there was such a rule and they leave, the police can go into the apartment building, tear down the wall, the, the door, and, and go in and find them. Is that what you're saying? No, I don't believe that entry into residential premises would be authorized on just this rule that we're asking for. The uh, entry in this situation was authorized by exigent yeah, but, circumstances but if, if created by additional... What you're saying is if somebody chooses not to obey the yes. order to stay around yes. or stay in, yes. how far can the police go to effectuate that order? I, I don't know. Why, why would there be a line at the apartment door? There wouldn't necessarily be a line at the apartment door if, assuming the order is lawful, then now we have the... Uh, now we have a situation where the passenger has disobeyed a lawful police command. And in that case, that itself is a crime. And so I'd suggest under those circumstances, then you would have to evaluate whether there's, a, whether there's exigency and appropriate probable cause to enter the, the residence. Can I just ask we you have to that? decide that issue? No, I don't believe you do. We're just looking at the search of the car here. Is that the only thing we're really looking you at? You don't have to decide that issue, and that, that would be my final point. I'd like to bring it, bring it back to the suppression of the physical evidence. Yeah, this was if a I can actually ask you one question. With regard to abandonment, let's assume the Commonwealth claims abandonment. How does the defendant rebut the claim of, of abandonment? except by admitting that he still claims possession. 
I don't, I don't think that's a concern for purposes of the suppression, Your Honor. I think that's a trial, a matter of trial strategy for the defendant. The defendant would have to decide whether it was better for him to assert uh, control over the vehicle in order to, uh, he has automatic standing to challenge the, um, the abandonment. And therefore, he can, you know, muster whatever evidence at a suppression hearing. So he has he standing likes. to claim it, and the Commonwealth says he abandoned it. How is the defendant supposed to rebut that, except to say, no, I didn't abandon it, and I still intended to maintain possession, and that's, of course, the element of the crime. Well, then I, only through the suppression hearing, I suppose the, the defendant may have a base of, on, a, on a, in a sense, it's a double-edged sword. If he, if he attempts to, uh, to justify the abandonment, uh, or excuse me, justify not abandoning, he may have, end up implicating himself in the possession, the ultimate possession crime, or at least providing some evidence. But I don't think it's conclusive on that point. I'd just like to say, and I realize my time is up, I don't believe that there is any evidence to draw from this record uh, that this was not a plain view search or that this gun was found on the floor of the car. There's no reasonable inference that can be drawn from this record. The only testimony was from an officer who had no personal knowledge of where that gun was allegedly photographed, and both of the officers testified consistently that it was in plain view on the vehicle's front seat. I'd also suggest that this was a valid search incident to arrest because the driver committed an arrestable offense by operating without a license, and the search of the vehicle was appropriate under those circumstances. How, how do you get past my namesake, the, the Arizona versus Gantt? Arizona versus Gantt recognized, and the appeals court in Commonwealth versus Young recognized, that an exception to Gantt exists where people remain, uh, where others besides the person secured away from the vehicle remain with, uh, continue to have access to the vehicle. And in this situation, those two individuals remained at large and could have returned to the vehicle and accessed the vehicle's interior. Can I just ask you a question about that? Of course, that. Your Honor. Um, uh, okay, you've got the, they've gone. You've got the driver who has a learner's permit and wasn't permitted to drive. Why, given that, and as you say, it's an arrestable offense, why wouldn't the car be towed to the police station? It, it would be towed, I believe, so, Your Honor. So, so why are we worried about what the other two are going to do? Because you're going to tow it. It may not. It, as I said at the beginning, I don't believe it matters necessarily for the suppression of the physical evidence. You have a, a plain view search. You have an... Uh, incident to a search, incident to arrest, and the fact that the two individuals were unlawfully seized, as Judge Page says, doesn't affect the, uh, the suppression or the seizure of the evidence within the vehicle. They have fled. The seizure occurs outside the vehicle and away from the physical evidence. And so I'd suggest that the seizure of the physical evidence uh, rises and falls with if this court finds there was a plain view search or a search incident to arrest, or inevitable discovery, or... Did you make an inevitable discovery? No, you? it was not made in our brief, Your Honor, and it was, there was no inventory search um, uh, argument made in the brief either. That's correct. Uh, I see my time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Counsel. May it please this honorable court, my name is Vincent Ricciardi, and I represent Mr. Fabian Perkins, who is the operator of this vehicle. On behalf of Mr. Perkins, I'd ask this, this court to uphold Judge Page's decision to suppress all of the physical evidence in this case. Judge Page made a finding that this was not a plain view search. She found that this was an intrusive search of that vehicle without legal basis. But um, Mr. Carley says, <clears throat> when you read the transcript, which I have not done, there is no, uh, that, that's just a factually erroneous finding. Now, I, can you respond to that? May I address that? This was a simple motor vehicle infraction, a stop sign violation. The vehicle stopped in a parking lot of a residence, a 14 or 12 unit residence, very well lit. The residential area abuts UMass Memorial Hospital in Worcester. The officer, upon approaching that vehicle, before he even exited the vehicle, called for backup. Uh, he asked for other officers to arrive for a situation that was essentially a stop sign violation. All I read was that he called to report the stop. Was that? No, if you he, read the he, transcript, Judge, he asked, and I believe Judge Page found that he asked for backup before exiting his cruiser. In, in that light, Judge, uh, again, he exits and he approaches and he sees the two passengers, and in his words, I believe, nonchalantly walking about 15 feet into the residential complex. He yells to them and they proceed into the complex. Running. He, one runs, one walks. I believe that one walks. Stop this pace. 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 At that point, he approaches the driver, Mr. Perkins, who is sitting, sitting there. He 
He grabs him out of the car at that point, and with the dome light on and with his flashlight lit, he's looking in the car, and according to Judge Page and according to the record, he sees nothing on that seat. He sees no weapons whatsoever. In fact, I'm, I'm sorry, Judge. I'm, I'm listening to you, but I did read the transcript. So <laughs> it, he says on uh, being prompted to say, yes, he did have a flashlight. Yes, he didn't notice. And he later says, you know, I wasn't looking for a gun at that point. I didn't notice a gun. And then, he t and then Officer Segur comes. He, they then look in the car. They both say, uh, uh, not doesn't mean the beginning or the end of the question, right. but they both say, yes, it's lying right there. And I think what you're going to go to, and this is my question, okay, they're both saying that he, I understand that the judge may not want to believe it or may not legitimately believe it. Apparently she doesn't believe it. Here's my question. How do they get, when the photograph is not in evidence, how does she get it to the floor of the car in some way that isn't visible to anybody, even though I understand there is a photograph, or at least there's an allusion to a photograph, and you know it may have taken, been taken in a different position than when it was found, but we don't know that. How do you uh, it replace may... the credibility issue with positive evidence of where the gun was found? Judge, I believe the credibility issue with regard to Officer Lavin and Officer Segur is st strategic to the, to the judge's decision here. If I may address that. Officer Lavin initially stated that he asked Mr. Perkins to get out of the car, and he did not handcuff him, according to his testimony, original testimony, he did not handcuff him until after that gun was found. Upon reviewing his police report and upon reviewing the grand jury minutes, he then found, uh, he then testified that he immediately, immediately upon getting Mr. Perkins out of the car, he cuffed him. When Mr. Perkins said he didn't know the identity of two individuals, he cuffed him and brought him to the back of the car. I accept that there was a lot of a inconsistency, lot of, a, but where do you get the evidence of the gun being in a place where it wasn't in plain view? That, that's the concern. According to, well, it was photographed on the floor of the vehicle. Um, and again, nobody indicated by the Commonwealth that it was seen on the floor of the vehicle. They said that it was seen on the front seat passenger. Judge Page chose not to believe that based on a number of his inconsistencies by Officer Lavin and Officer Segur. Again, I'm sorry. Was there testimony about where it was photographed? Passenger's front floor. No, I'm, but the question is, yes, there was yes, testimony? Yes, there was, yes. Passenger's front floor. And again, testimony by the officer who didn't take the photograph, that he was aware of a photograph that showed it on the floor, and he didn't know when it was taken. Again, Judge, if I may, according to the testimony, uh, Officer Segur comes back from his initial uh, response to the building. And at that point, there are two other officers there, by the way, right. besides Officer Lavin. I believe Officer, Officer Fanion and Officer Stone arrived. And again, no observations by any of those officers of a gun on the seat. At which point, um, Officer Segur says, says to Officer Lavin, have you searched the car yet? Now again, Judge, I think that is also a critical bit of information here of the, of the officer's intention at that point on this limited motor vehicle stop. At that point, Officer Segur testifies that he looks in the vehicle and he sees the gun on the seat. Within a minute later, it was Officer Fallon who showed up, according to the testimony, and photographed the gun on the floor. Again, Judge, that was the testimony that was given, and that was the testimony that was relied on by Judge Page. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, when um, Mr. Perkins was taken out and um, uh, handcuffed, was the uh, car door, the passenger, I mean, the driver's door open and the dome light on? When he was taken out and cuffed, the car door was open, the dome light was on. So that would be in addition to the flashlight? In addition to the flashlight, in addition to this well-lit area adjacent to UMass Memorial Hospital, Judge. Okay. You know, Counsel, your time is up. I'm very sorry. Thank you. Thank you. May it please the Court, my name is Brad Benny, and I'm here representing um, Mr. Hendricks. Uh, he is the the person who was found in, uh, or who was uh, at the stop in the uh, front passenger uh, seat. Uh, the one who exited uh, the vehicle and was ultimately found in the apartment. Uh, unless there are any other questions, I'd, I'd like to discuss uh, with my time uh, the re-entry order. If I, if I just, just to be clear, there was nothing found on his person. There were no fruits that arose from his seizure. 
correct? Right. He, there was nothing found on him. So the only thing that you're seeking to suppress are, the, are those things which were found in the car? Yes. So... Because he's being, just, he's being prosecuted for the, the drugs gun. and the guns. Right. The gun. Oh, and the cocaine? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So as Justice Cordy said, um, under the federal constitution, there's a seizure uh, uh, during the traffic stop. Uh, and uh, a passenger uh, can be given an order to remain in the car. This is uh, an open question to the states with respect to state constitutional law. It hasn't been addressed here. And this is the first chance for you to, to address it. Um, states have gone in a different direction. I, I think it's safe to say that a majority of states have adopted the federal stance, which seems to be burdensome and heavy-handed. And there's no evidence. Burdensome and heavy-handed. Uh, I mean, there's a traffic stop. There's been a violation. There's an officer. Uh, don't you think that the officer has the right to maintain the status quo while he or she does what needs to be done to investigate the violation? I don't, and let me explain why. Because no. uh, these types of scenarios depend on facts. So for I give you a, a nice uh, pattern in my uh, brief with respect to a police officer uh, coming upon a man uh, who is jaywalked to meet an acquaintance on the other side of the street. Um, I think that's a good example. You can come up with uh, scenarios. Remember, this is not a case where uh, there was a, a chase a stop and then uh, people were fleeing from the car. This is not a case where there was a stop uh, and the police officer is seeing all sorts of furtive gestures uh, from the passenger oh, before he gets let out. Let me, let me say, the, the, the officer put his lights on, Yes. parked behind the car, was getting out of the car, the two passengers got out and started to right. leave. He basically told them to stop, one ran and the other picked up his pace. That's right. right. So you, you think that's okay? The officers just live with it. Just well, live with it, it's again, okay. Uh, in this case, yes. Uh, the, the, uh, the how's an officer to know? How, how's an off police officer to know? W you say this case, but how is an officer to know that anybody in the, that, that leaves the car isn't positioning themselves to, uh, to attack the officers? And, and isn't that a, a reasonable expectation on the part of the police officers to protect his own safety? No, because as I, as I say in my brief, not every minor traffic stop needs to be approached with guns drawn but, but how does and the officer and know? The, the most innocuous police stop could result in death. That's, that's true. Um, but again... And, and, and it's, it's, it's not too much to ask people to stay in the car until the police officer finishes with the... Uh, that depends on the person and whether they want to engage in a conversation and be subject to questioning from the police officer. I mean, in, in, in this Commonwealth... Case law is clear that people do not have to uh, engage with police officers if they've done nothing wrong. They don't have to engage uh, or answer questions from police officers uh, just for being uh, with somebody who has committed a minor traffic violation. The car is seized, though, and that protects the individuals as well. They're all deemed to be seized because the court has concluded they wouldn't feel free to walk away. I certainly wouldn't feel free to walk away from a car that's been stopped by a police officer. Would you? Well, I, I don't think that that's relevant to our discussion here because... Well, it's relevant as to whether someone would be seized. The court says, yes, they, a, a reasonable person would feel that way, and therefore they are seized for constitutional yes, that's, purposes. Yes, that's true, but the, the individual who's done nothing wrong, the, the passenger, gets to make a choice at this point. And it, it really is the only point that they get to make that choice, right? Because uh, if, you, if you carry out... Uh, the scenario here, once it's found that uh, this passenger or that the driver uh, is only on a learner's permit, uh, then case precedent says that the inquiry can then focus on the passenger. Of course. This is the only chance that they get to leave and to keep that basic right to not engage with police if they choose not to. After all, uh, at this point, they've done nothing wrong. Now, am I correct that when they entered the home to apprehend Mr. Hendricks, they already had found the, 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 the gun in the car. That's true. So it's, it's building on... Um, so, so at that time, if the search of the car was a good search, they had probable cause to arrest him for possession of the firearm. Right. And in this case, uh, going in and seeing the damage um, to the door, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the judge found uh, exigent circumstances would have existed. But again, we're, we're focusing on that stop 
uh, and with respect to Mr. Hendricks, uh, whether the reentry order was valid. Council, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Your Honor. It's Greg Batten for uh, Elijah Cherry. Um, if the court has any questions, otherwise I can go into addressing whether or not the... Uh, Again, just to be clear, nothing found on Mr. Cherry's person? Uh, no, no. He was the one who ran around the building and then came back out and was arrested so, so after there, that. So there, there are no fruits you're seeking to suppress arising from his seizure? Uh, to, I'm, I'm unaware of anything found in his person relative to this motor vehicle stuff. So it would be the gun and the drugs found in the motor vehicle at the time. D- did he lose uh, standing to, to challenge the, the, the possessory crime? Uh, and I frankly find the government's argument about abandonment a bit disingenuous. Um, uh, being put between a rock and a hard place is an understatement, as uh, Your Honor's already pointed out. He's stuck either saying, I own it, and it's my in, and therefore let me go into court and try to suppress it, or I have nothing to do with it, and therefore I can't challenge whether or not you're going to impute this evidence and, But to I take it that the, the lack of abandonment from your view is... Uh, because, as Justice Lank said at the beginning, um, the evidence was that um, he was walking, he may have started running, but we don't really know. It, it's not sufficient to indicate he has no interest in the car. Well, Judge, I don't, uh, I don't agree there's abandonment, period, but to your point, I don't know. N- no facts came out during the course of that hearing to show... Well, I mean, show- he left the car. He so, left the car, I mean, he left the motor vehicle. At least a threshold possibility that he has abandoned He the walked car. away from the motor vehicle, but there's nothing in the facts to suggest he knew of the location of the weapon or the drugs, that, that, that he even knew that he was abandoning anything at the time he left the motor vehicle. So I don't know what he knew, where he knew it oh, was, it- and... Right, but I mean... I think you'd need some... To, to abandon something, you're going to have to suggest that he has to know where it is or that he has an interest in it because he's got to give up what he thinks his right is in the property at that particular but, point in time. But what about the question of standing, though? Did he abandon standing to raise the issue by fleeing? Uh, no, no, because we're charged with a possessory offense and we have a motor vehicle where passengers are in the motor vehicle. They're seized when the blue lights go on and it's reasonable to uh, assume clearly that the driver the motor vehicle has a reasonable expectation of privacy in that car which is then passed along to the passengers so no it's automatic under those circumstances because those two criteria are met abandonment runs afoul of that because if you did you know if you got to stand up and say well as just as Gans pointed out I, I, I left the property and I abandoned it the government's clearly going to try to use that at trial but then how does he come into challenge, I have standing to contest what the officers did if I abandoned it. I mean, it just doesn't work that way, and I think that's the whole point of the automatic standing rule, um, so that a person is not in a position to either have to run away from the property and, and devoid himself of all rights to challenge the evidence or admit to having it and impute <coughs> liability to him or herself under the circumstances in order to try to challenge what ultimately would be suppressed. So I... I I think abandonment runs afoul of what uh, our automatic standing rule clearly sets out and protects an individual uh, from that double-edged sword, if you will. Any other questions? Uh, Thank you, sir. I'll I'll be brief. I just just do think that uh, Mr. Cherry was seized at that point in time. Um, And to be brief, I think the government's request for a bright-line rule uh, ordering passengers to remain in vehicles, order order them back, um, stop, come back here, get back in the motor vehicle, uh, clearly is a seizure that requires some sort of justification, in my opinion. So let me just explore that. You think he was seized, but you don't think he was seized? No, I think he was seized because of the motor vehicle stop. But if he was seized, why, why can't the police officer just, because it's a seizure, why can't the police officer just, unlike under federal law, well, say, because, you know, you're under our control? It, well, I mean, how can it be that he was seized for one purpose but not for the other? Well, uh, you know, the, the, this court the, and, and the federal jurisprudence have already dictated that someone in a motor vehicle when the blue lights go on is seized for constitutional purposes. This court and in, in this state, we've gone so far now to say that, well, you know, the purpose of the stop defines the inquiry. We're dealing with the driver under the circumstances for the motor vehicle infraction. What do the passengers do to warrant further intrusion by the government? Well, I, 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 I suppose... Go ahead. 
I suppose to the ex to some extent th there are sh there should be some consequences and, and the consequences I take it you might say are well he could be charged with violating the lawful or disobeying the lawful order of a police officer but that doesn't go to the suppression issue that's but the order to stop and stay is based on what the passenger is not associated with what we have in this limited case the motor vehicle infraction you, th this court has held already. The passenger, you got to point to specific and articulable facts relative to the person. To order him to get out of the car. To order him to get out. But for federal constitutional purposes, Fourth Amendment, we can't avoid this. He is seized. He is seized, but it doesn't justify government intrusion. It doesn't justify enforcing the seizure by saying you really are seized. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't. You're seized for our purposes because you happen to be in the car, but we take it to the next level. Okay, if you want to address government action as it respects to the front of the backseat passenger, tell us what that person has done for you to inquire, ask for identification, keep your hands where I can see them. Something has to happen with respect to the passenger. Now, I'm not saying... It happened. Stay in the car. For what, but why does he have to stay in the car when this court is because made? I because I the police officer don't want you to to go 50 feet away and position yourself where my my safety might be endangered. Oh, what? What's he done? He doesn't. He, he what, doesn't when I come to the conclusion that because someone it's a gets reasonable a, order. It's not a reasonable order without justification. If they have to, if you have to order them out of the motor vehicle based on specific and articulable facts or a fact that suggests the officer's safety or safety of others are in danger, you've got to impute something to that person merely not getting out of a motor vehicle and walking away. How is that a safety concern for anybody? Also, we've got to leave it there. Thank you, Thank Judge. you.